On March 22nd, 1999, a woman, naked except for an iron slave collar tied around her neck, was seen running down a road in New Mexico. She was begging for help from passing cars, but because of her dishevelled state, no one was stopping. The woman then ran into a trailer that had an open door, and the person inside called the police. The dishevelled woman was Cynthia Vigel, 22 years old, and she had spent three days in the toy box, being tortured by its sadistic owner, David Parker Ray. Welcome all in to the MO Podcast. Dark. Welcome all into the MO Podcast Dark Edition. As always, you're here with me, Contumacious Ant. And me, Atreya. And today we are going to be talking about David Parker Ray, who was also known as the Toy Box Killer. <laughs> Not the Toolbox Killer. No. Uh, that was another program. Uh, <laughs> yes, it was. That's why I was like, ooh. <laughs> Because so, I know the toolbox killers. I mean, not personally, but I know of them, but I haven't heard this one. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay. Well, that's, that's all right then. Uh, so, it's a bit of an, an acronym, that, because he was never actually convicted of murder, but he was suspected of killing up to 60 women. 60? Six zero. Six zero women. And in his own journals that were used as evidence and that the police found, he claimed to have murdered 40. But despite Why do you write that down? Oh, he wrote a lot of stuff down. (sighs) Like, if you're a serial killer, don't journal it. Like, just rule number one. Yeah. Never talk about Serial Killer Club. Yeah, one of Simon's rules, uh, if you ever watch... Uh, Simon Whistler, he always says that's the number one rule, never write anything down and don't tell anyone. I but mean, duh. David Ray Parker didn't listen to him. Uh, but despite claiming all this, he was never actually charged with murder and no bodies have ever been discovered because Ray refused to cooperate with authorities. So... Ray was brought up by his grandfather, who was a stern disciplinarian, but he was visited sporadically by his violent, alcoholic dad. Now... Happy childhood. Yeah, it gets worse. On these sporadic visits, his dad would give Ray hardcore pornography magazines. And how old was he at the time? Well, this is one of the things... He... So, it's interesting to point out that Ray wouldn't start fantasising about rape and sexual torture until he was a teenager. So, at what point his father gave him these magazines is unknown. So, he, he had all these magazines and it was, as well as being hardcore porn, they were heavily depicted sadomasochism in them. Like, what... Sorry, I didn't have time to go to the toy shop, so you can just have some of my old sticky pornos. You know, there's a lot of things, and I'll be honest with you, I am borderline alcoholic, but if I turned up to see my child that I hadn't seen in a couple of months, I wouldn't stop off at the nearest fucking SL garage and go to the top shelf. That would not be my first thought of getting him a present. It's a really weird choice of present. (laughs) Yeah, Uh, and obviously this kind of shaped the person that he was going to be. Out of high school, Ray joined the army and he was given an honourable discharge. He worked in the army as, uh, um, he did a lot of jobs there, but he worked primarily as a mechanic. 
And after he left the army, he started working as a mechanic and ended up getting a job with the New Mexico Parks Department, which in turn led him, led him to know the New Mexico area very well, especially the desolate places where you could maybe hide a body. Uh, mm. So Ray himself claimed in his journals that he had been raping bitches ever since he was old enough to jerk off. That's a direct uh, quote. Uh, I mean... Yeah, so he's, go he's going in hard straight away here. Apparently. And he his killings are speculated to start around the mid-1950s. Now, Ray lived and operated out of Elephant Boot, which is unironically seven miles north of the town, which is called Truth and Consequences in Sierra County. Now, And probably completely devoid of any elephants. Yeah. So, Truth and Consequences was actually named after a radio show. I don't know if they had a referendum on that. It was called something else. Or if they just started building and went, yeah, we'll go with that. One of the builders was listening to it. The foreman was listening to the radio and went, seems, seems apt enough, doesn't it? Uh, coast to coast's already been picked. It's down the road, so scrap that one. It's truth and consequences or capital FM. Pick one. Exactly. Fuck it out. Oh, Gemma Atkinson in the morning. Doesn't really work, does it? Uh, so, Cynthia Virgil was abducted from an Albuquerque parking lot while she was engaged in sex work. Ray had offered her money in exchange for oral sex, but when she got into the car with Ray, she saw Ray's partner, Cindy Hendy, and she immediately started feeling uncomfortable. Before she could try and back out, Ray pulled out a fake cop badge and told her that she was under arrest for soliciting prostitution. So he had a girlfriend at this time? He had a partner. And I mean that in both sets of the oh, world. Oh, right, okay. It wasn't just him that did it. It was a Brady and Hindley sort of deal. It was a, uh, it was a family affair, let's just say. Okay. There were other people involved further down the line. Ah, yeah. So Cynthia was then driven around for several hours until Ray finally took her to the toy box, which we'll come to later. Now, this was a trailer back in Elephant Boot, which was over 140 miles away from where Ray had picked Cynthia up. So his MO would be drive out of town, go as far away as you can, engage people for sex work and then take them back to the toy box. So he started off with a solid plan. So his plan's like, we'll drive as far away as possible so that we'll not be suspects. We'll pick up somebody that's likely to not be missed because they're a prostitute or a sex worker. We'll bring them home. We'll rape them, torture them, what have you. And I'll make a note of all of this in my journal afterwards. Yeah. Yeah. Why didn't you just pick them up next door if that's the case? Like, Well, one of his victims, uh, he actually did. So, oh, for God's sake. Yeah. Now, Cynthia was tied securely to a chair and a tape cassette was played to her. It appears that Ray had done this so much, he was tired of wasting his voice on what would happen to what? the upcoming women and he would give them basically an itinerary of what was going to happen to them. So he jigsawed them? Yeah. Now, the transcript wow. of the tape is out there, but it describes what goes on in the toy box. And I personally, if I could have it any other way, I would give it a miss, but I had to bleach my eyes and my brain after reading some of it. It basically says that the kidnapped women will be held for a couple of months. They'll be subject to brainwashing, including a cocktail of sodium pentothal and penobarbital, excuse me. They What's would have that? 
What's the second one? So, uh, Pen and Barbatera is like, uh, it's a, so the first one's Truth Serum, obviously. Truth and serum. Bar Bitch, yeah. Bar, uh, Bar Bituin is like a, a downer kind of right, okay. uh, drug, I think, as far as I know. They, the women that he was playing this tape to would have all manner of sexual acts performed on them, including, by the way, if I've not said it, trigger warning, sorry. You should've, haven't. Yeah, no, should have put that in. So, uh, yeah. So they would have an all manner of sexual acts performed on them, including rape, having objects, including oversized dildos inserted into them, sex acts on both him and his partner, Hendy, and even sex acts involving animals. Oh, God, I hate these people already. Yeah. So... We'll discuss the toy box and what it was. It was basically a soundproof trailer that was located near Ray's home in Elephant Butte. Now, Elephant Butte had a population of roughly 1,300 people, and it was kind of a a big place. So there was sporadically people here in trailer parks, but then no one for a few miles. And then, so it was surrounded by a state park, a reservoir and miles of abandoned land. So, as the adage, perfect. Yeah. So, as the adage goes, nobody could hear you scream out there. Uh, in the actual trailer, there was a metal ring welded to the floor. The kidnapped women would have a slave neck chain attached to them, and then attached to the ring in the floor. So their movements were very limited in what they could do. Ray had also set up a VCR and TV in which he could play videos of previous torture victims to try and mentally break the kidnapped women. Oof. Yeah. It's reported that Ray spent upwards of $100,000 to pimp out this trailer into getting it into the way he wanted. What did he do for a living? So he worked in the Parks and Recreation for Oh, New right, yeah. Mexico. Was it really high paying? I don't know. Maybe he was frugal. Uh, that's the only thing I could think of. Because it, it doesn't say where this wealth has come from. I don't think he was a, a thief. I don't think he, he, he robbed people in, in, well, apart from their dignity. But I don't think he physically took... They took keepsakes, obviously, but I don't think he took money off them or drove them to the ATM machine and said, give me all your money kind of thing. I think. He Do was... we know what the woman did? No, actually, I don't. Thanks for that. <laughs> Looks like a shit research there. Uh... <laughs> okay, so we'll just assume that she was an heiress to a brewery. Yeah, she was rich, right? So uh... She was rich. That's where they got the money to do up their trailer. Yeah. So Cynthia wasn't going to sit still and let this happen to her. And on the third day of being held captive on March 22nd, 1999, she seized on the opportunity to escape. Now, for some reason, the keys to her chains had been left on a set of drawers after Ray had left for work. Hendy was there, and even though this would be a real danger for Cynthia... If she went for the keys, she went for it anyway. She grabbed the keys and she had a lamp smashed over her head for her troubles. She still somehow managed to get free and even managed to stab Hendy in the neck with an ice pick. Go on, Cynthia. Yeah. So the fact that there was an ice pick to hand shows kind of what went on in the toy box. Uh, Cynthia then... it was, though. Well, yeah, indeed. Cynthia then tried to flag down help from passing cars, but due to the fact that she was in the middle of nowhere, she was naked, and she had an iron slave collar still attached to her neck, the two and cars... And an ice pick in one hand. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> covered in blood. Uh, <laughs> the two cars that she did manage to see just, like, rolled up the windows, shut the door, and just kept on driving. Luckily for her, she was in... A populated area, inverted commas, populated. Uh, and although she passed several trailers, they all seemed locked and they seemed like no one was home. 
but luckily one had its door open. Cynthia burst through the door and begged the homeowner to ring the police, which, after getting her a robe and sitting her down, they did. Now, Ray and Hendy were arrested, and after the news coverage, another woman came forward to tell her story of the toy box. Angelica Montana had been held captive by Ray and Hendy after coming over to borrow some cake mix. Cake mix? Yeah. She just wanted to make a cake. She went to a neighbour's house to see if they had any cake mix, and she was subjected to just... Um... Don't get involved with your neighbours. <laughs> I think that's the moral. Yeah. I just, uh... I feel like it, if it just popped into my head, I really fucking want to make a cake right now. And I knew I didn't have any cake shit downstairs. I'd just be like, well, guess I can't make a cake. Yeah. I'll just put the telly back on. <laughs> like, what, what possesses somebody to go, no, I must make this cake at all costs. I'm banging I think, on their neighbours' doors. Give me cake mix. I think as well, because it was so sparsely populated that it was kind of neighbours help each other out. Do you know what I mean? Like the, the pop round for a cup of sugar kind of shit. Nobody does that. I know, not nowadays anyway. I mean, this was in back, well, back in the day. Uh, I mean, even like, okay, fine, sugar, milk. Can I have Can I have a cup of milk? I've run out of milk and I'm desperate for a cup of. But full on cake mix? Like ready-made cake mix, so you just kind of put it in a bowl and bank stir it and bang it in the oven? Or, yeah. hi, I really want to make a cake. Could I have flour, I eggs, eggs, butter, yeah. <laughs> sugar? <laughs> some uh, cocoa powder I've literally got nothing in the trailer yeah uh, you just don't do that to your neighbours you don't put on to people that much well I don't know I personally wouldn't but obviously some people do I mean yeah so Angelica was raped and tortured in similar ways to Cynthia but after convincing the couple that she wasn't going to tell anyone she was released a high, a, a longer highway a few days later. Now, she managed... Stop her parrot idiots. Yeah, but it gets worse. Because she managed to flag down an off-duty cop. So of all the cars that were passing, it was an off-duty cop. She told them what had happened, but he didn't believe her. He dropped her off at a bus stop and just said, Be on your way, love. Did she not have any, like, marks or, like, injuries to go, hey, look what they've done to me? I would say she would have done, but I think because of the mind control or at least the drugs that were involved in this, I think she came across as being a drug addict and Mm -hmm. the police didn't care. Now, Angelica did phone the police later on, but again, there was no follow-up, and she was never interviewed at the time about what had happened to her. Unfortunately, in all of these dark stories, the police are the fucking idiots that fuck this up. Okay, he's a sick man. Parker and, and Hendy are sick, sick people, but if the police would have stepped in, maybe they could have stopped this. So... Did they believe Cynthia? Yes, just because so the, of the state so that she was in. Oh, right. Okay. So I was she's naked. Say, so they'll believe a sex, sex worker, but they'll not believe some woman who was just wanting to bake a cake in a trailer park. Yeah, now, uh, it does come up in the trial that she was a sex worker. So, uh, yeah. But during the investigation, uh, a plethora of videotapes and journals were discovered within the toy box that detailed the extent of Ray's depravity. Now, on one of these videos, which was dated 1996, so this is three years before Cynthia was taken to the toy box, another victim, Kelly Garrett, was identified by a tattoo on her ankle. Now, Kelly was abused for two days by Ray after being drugged and dropped off by his daughter, Jesse Ray. So he had his daughter as well as his partner. And how old was she? 
So she was, I think she was 20 odd at this time. So not a kid. No, no, like, no, no, not no, like no, a, no. Not like a like a 16 year old. No, 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 no. So Kelly was taken back home by Jessie Ray uh, because she was drinking with her. She was basically roofied by Ray's daughter in the bar and she was taken back there. So Kelly was taken back home by Ray and he claimed that he found her on a beach. She was incoherent and because she couldn't remember what had happened to her over the past couple of days, they assumed she was on drugs and her family told her to leave. Wow. Gets worse. Her piece of shit husband then filed for divorce because he thought Kelly was cheating on her. Never once wow. asking any questions, just jumped to the assumption. And Kelly was forced to move away to Colorado. Wow. Now, Ray's daughter, Jessie, had tried reporting her father to the FBI in the late 80s, apparently, stating that David Parker Ray was abducting, torturing women and selling them to buyers in Mexico. But either the FBI didn't follow up on it or they did a shit investigation because, again, nothing came of it and the only thing they interviewed him for was manufacturing and selling bondage paraphernalia. Okay. Firstly, I don't know that it's illegal to make and sell bondage paraphernalia. And secondly, so... One minute his daughters are like, oh, hey, my dad's a degrading pervert. Will you please go and arrest him and lock him up? And then next it's, hey, dad, I brought some sweet chick home for you to rape and kill. What? Yeah. So by 1995, Jesse had done a full 180, 360, whatever the fuck you want to call it. But she was hands on helping him. And her former girlfriend, <laughs> Jill Trioa, disappeared in 1995 after drinking in the same bar as Kelly Garrett. It's assumed that she was again roofied at the bar like Kelly and then Jesse took her to her father who tortured and murdered her. What but I I don't understand I don't understand why she I don't I'm confused. I, I genuinely don't know but I I you have to assume that Ray had a controlling personality and he was someone who I, he was a sick piece of shit and maybe if he's doing this to women that he takes off the street maybe he was doing this in his own home to these Ugh. women that live with him uh, but it has to be said that Hendy was a willing accomplice with him she took part in the torture she took part in the rape as well she was in the toy box with him there's no evidence that Jesse was taking part in the rape and the torture, but she would quite happily drop people off. Yeah, her mates. Yeah. Fucking hell. So to do that to your mates, I hate to think what she did to her enemies. Yeah. So on one of the tapes that was discovered, it was the introduction tape from above. Ray Ray claims that the couple would take six to seven women a year to be their sex slaves. And this was dated in 1993. So up until the time he was caught, which was 1999, if you just do the maths, he could have had 50 victims within the toy box in that time. Now, I whether... mean, were they not aware that you... I'm, I'm fairly sure you can get like BDSM sex workers that are quite happy to do this kind of thing and be paid for it and go on their merry way and you can call them back anytime you like. You don't have to, you know, kidnap people off the street yeah. and get it done completely legally. I'm I'm fairly sure there's got to be... Indeed. And this is, this is one of the things that he said at trial, that they were willing people who had come along because a lot of them, like, because Cynthia was a sex worker, he turned around and said, no, I told her what was going to happen when we got there and... And because she was a sex worker, the jury went, maybe it's true. Maybe. Maybe that's what so, she wanted. So did Cynthia... That did, so when she stabbed Hendy, which, by the way, is a fucking stupid name, 
right? It's like she was her mom was supposed to write Mandy and she slipped with the pen or something, right? So when she stabbed Hendy in the neck with a pickaxe, did it not kill her? No. So it incapacitated her, but it didn't kill her because as soon as the police turned up, she was taken away to hospital. Uh, How thick is her neck? Yeah, yeah. I don't think she Fucking hit hell. anything that mattered, unfortunately. Uh, so we come to the trial, which was unfortunately, as we have seen by I'm not saying it's New Mexico now, but New Mexico then, they were just fucking idiots. Uh, Judge Neil Mertz decided to have separate trials for each individual. Now, this would obviously weaken the case because each individual, all the three individuals, could corroborate each other's evidence. Mm -hmm. But in individual trials, it was their word against Ray's. So... Mm -hmm. Ray claimed that although his sexual pref practices were outside the norm, all the victims consented. He also claimed that all the journals and the videos that had been found, they were just a work of fantasy. He was just writing out his fantasies. This, wasn't, this didn't actually happen. And apparently in his videos he put a disclaimer at the beginning that said this is for like fucking fantasy use, this isn't real, everyone's consented to this da, da, da. now the idiot of a judge as well Neil Mertz, let's never forget his fucking name, he ruled out all the evidence found in the trailer could not be used in Kelly's and Angelica's trial why? because because Cynthia's trial was the last one and they found it in 1999, he, the judge, went on the theory that he could have bought that in 1999. He could have put all that right, stuff okay. in there in 1999. So he was saying, basically, he's had this trailer out there for years and years and years, but only in 1999, and to do this to Cynthia, he decided to buy all this shit. But it's irrelevant because he's still... Did it to her. Exactly, so exactly. They still, he still did it, whether he did it late or not. Yeah, Kelly... More than once. <laughs> Kelly and Angelica still testify to what happened to them. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Whether he did it once or or more, it's irrelevant. He did it the once and that's it. That's all you need to know. When someone's going to yeah. do it once, surely they've got a poncho on for You're it. You're still they've, guilty, yeah. Yeah, all right, there is a start place to everything, but not when it's the very last fucking victim. To come forward, it wouldn't be like, oh, that, yeah, that's where he went wrong. Not after the yeah. other two that he had. Yeah. So Ray had a heart attack in custody, which put a lot of delays onto the trial. And even after he recovered, Judge Mertz decided to try the case of Kelly rather than Cynthia first. The case that he threw out. Yeah, so basically he's just he's just like deciding what he wants to have this go forth. And I don't understand. If they're all individual trials, why they're all being tried under the same judge as well. Surely mm -hmm. it's like a lottery, a lottery. You just pick, you get your trials rather than he goes, oh, here we go, we've got three here. I'll have all Seems them. Seems a bit like a conflict of interests. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so... Cynthia's had the weakest evidence because it was the earliest. It was in 1996. And a lot of evidence was recorded by Ray and dated after her abduction. So why he tried to put the weakest one on first, God only knows. But mm. the trial, again, for Kelly was a farce because two jurors stated on record that her account was unbelievable. One of them even stated that some people are into rough sex. Maybe that's what she wanted. What? <laughs> right, okay. So it's the whole, she was wearing them clothes, so maybe that is she why was she was asking got for Yeah, exactly, yeah, okay. exactly. Uh, now... What the fuck? Yeah, Kelly's trial was a mistrial, and during jury selection for the new trial, Judge Mertz died. And everybody celebrated. 
I was going to say. Ah, oh, I love it. Happy endings. So a new judge was appointed, and thankfully, Kelly's testimony was treated a lot better than during the first trial. Ray's defence lawyer, who was obviously a piece of shit, I mean, I know defence lawyers have to do their job, but he was a complete piece of shit because he claimed that Kelly had made this all up as a fantasy. Nothing ever happened. fantasy? Nothing ever happened. This is what she wanted to happen, and it was all in her head. Who wants this to happen to them, please? (laughs) Exactly. Now, Ray claimed to be innocent and said if he was convicted, he would take it to the Supreme Court. He was found guilty on all 12 charges. Good. So that's good. But he gave an interview to a local TV station saying, and this is fucking rank, I got pleasure out of women getting pleasure. I did what they wanted me to do. I don't think you did, bro. Yeah. He also claimed that the the tapes were made during consent. They had an adult content warning on him, uh, on them, and they were just a fantasy. So I don't know where he got his editing software for the nineties to put all this on. But fuck me, I want it because Jesus. <laughs> no, it's one of them built-in ones, you know, with the, the on you get the Sony camcorders. My dad had a massive Sony camcorder, and it had built-in like you put little title screens on, and th- it was very early nineties, late eighties kind of deal. Yeah. Uh, So in his second trial, which was a Cynthia Virgil trial, he claimed innocence again. But after a week, Ray had taken a plea deal that would make sure his daughter, Jessie, would have five years of probation rather than face any prison time. Now, just going to say there wasn't a third trial because, unfortunately, Angelica died of pneumonia. Now, the reason she died of pneumonia is because she had become a drug ag- addict just to try and cover up get or over to the get trauma. away. Exactly, to deal with the trauma in her own way. So Ray would never stand trial for that. But as soon as Jesse was sentenced, Ray appealed the deal so the judges just slammed down the gavel and said yeah all right you've made this plea deal so jesse you can get five years of probation rather than any prison time don't do anything wrong in them five years as soon as the gavel went down ray appealed the deal that he had previously made he claimed i fucking hate plea deals why are they even a thing why do they let them do it i don't know but he claimed hate it that he was coerced into it and his mound his mind was cloudy due to the heart medication that he was on. Yeah, right. Yeah, like, it wasn't sodium pentothal then. Fucking hell. Uh, <laughs> so basically, he got brought in front of a panel of three judges, appeal judges, and they turned around and went, no, you can fuck right off. The evidence mm-hmm. is clear. You've made this deal. So you are now getting sentenced to 224 years. Love it. Now, bear in mind, this wasn't a murder sentence. This was the, for the kidnap and torture of these women. He was never charged with murder. <laughs> See, this is this is what I don't get, right? Okay, so absolutely he fucking deserves 200 plus years in prison. 100% all on board with that. But he hasn't been charged with murder. And then you get people who torture, rape and mutilate and murder and then dismember people left right and center and they get like seven years yeah i'm sorry what (laughs) yeah i don't understand i mean i'm not a lawyer but it it seems pretty clear cut to me you get more time for murder than you do for talk for a kidnap surely You'd, you'd, you'd like to think but he during his plea bargain or one of the points of his plea bargain was that he was supposed to assist authorities into the investigation to find further victims of his but he refused i think they should have waterboarded him until he remembered yeah so i mean i think at this point like the plea deal should have been thrown out and he should have been retried and i'm not 100 percent sure but maybe new mexico has a death sentence and maybe he should have gone up for that But as he was being arraigned into being interrogated 
about this information that he should have given. He had a heart attack and died. God damn it. So he is he got out of it. dead, but he got, yeah, yeah, 100%. He got out of it <laughs> by his own means. Now. I think it should have been death by a thousand cuts. It should have been fucking that box thing. Can't the box the thing? Name. Yeah. That one in the box with the ants eating your bum and honey. Oh, scafism. Scafism, there you go, yeah. Yeah, oh, da- oh yeah, 100%. That would be cool. I mean, it would, it's not cool, but it would be cool if it was for him, yeah. Yeah. So, Jesse Ray actually went to prison. She served two and a half years in prison for her Is role in this, and she was given five years of probation. Cindy Hendy was sentenced to 36 years at the age of 40, and she was released in 2019. So she's fucking, she's out. Yes. Uh, I heard a rumour that she was living free in Montana. Whether there's Probably a- under witness protection. Yeah, yeah. Whether there's any, any, any truth to that, I don't know. But she served the time and maybe she's been rehabilitated, but she was part of a duo that raped and tortured and possibly, not even possibly, murdered people. Because Cindy Hendy, on the stand, actually said that uh, Ray had killed 14 people. She said he had killed 14 people. And he, the first victim that he killed, he apparently, allegedly, whatever, took out to a... Uh, killed them, then took them out to a lake... And in one of his journals, he described this. He threw the body overboard, but it wouldn't sink. And it's at that point that he learned that he needs to cut the stomach open and take out the innards so they would sink. I did not know that, but that is very useful information. I mean, it is, yeah, but it's learned information. You don't just, do you know what I mean? You don't just pick that up. Yeah, you, I, well, I, I never knew that, which yeah. I think... Goes to show that I've never thrown a body in a lake. Exactly. I mean, if there's one thing that can come from this, a traitor is not a murderer. Uh, well, I mean, I'd, I'm not a murderer, but the fact is, there's nothing that says, there's no how-to book on how to bury somebody under your patio. It's kind of just, I watch Brookside, you know? Yeah. Oh, God, that episode where... Who was it that found the, the body and there was just a hand in the, in the soil? Oh, my God. I think I was about nine. I had nightmares for months. Jesus Christ. Yeah. It's a good episode, though. Indeed. Indeed. And uh, what's mental is that it was, uh, what, was it six? It, it was like less than a year before Fred West got arrested. In that episode. Was it really? Yeah. Trust me, I've done the research. We've got a Fred West episode coming up. Oh, okay. I didn't. Points. It was before. I didn't know that. That that he he got arrested, so he was already burying bodies under the patio. But it was it was before that he actually got arrested. Because he got arrested in ninety nine, I think, and that was that was been in ninety eight, ninety seven. Do you reckon one of his friends worked in the crew? Like, and it, he'd been down the pub, and he was like, "Best way to hide a body is to bury them under your patio." And they were like, "Oh my god, I work for Brookside. That that." That is an idea right there. Indeed. He, he may have got a writing credit on that fucking episode. Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> Written and produced by Fred West. Fucking hell. Uh, mm-hmm. Yeah, so that is the uh, the Toy Box Killer. It's the Toy Box Killer, David see- Ray Parker. It's... Uh, I need to see what this guy looks like. So there are uh, there were there are pictures out there. No, I'm. I need to see what he looks like. Okay. So just be careful what oh, you Google. So, oh so yeah. He's not even fit. Oh god, no, no, we didn't have anything about him. Because I thought, like, maybe if he's saying, like, not that it would ever be true, but I thought if he's saying, "Oh, these women wanted me. They fucking wanted me." Like, if he was hot. Like maybe they did, but he's just a creepy old man. No, exactly. There's nothing. There's nothing to him at all. And there are also transcripts 
out there. There are videos out there because it was put into the public. It's been used as evidence. I don't think the videos are out there, but there is certainly a transcript of his audio. And there he's are pictures. He's smiling in that mugshot. Yeah. Smiling. Yeah. And he's smiling in a lot of the pictures. He thought he was untouchable. He thought this... And to be honest with you, the judge probably gave him a lot of hope in the way that he dealt with the trial. And maybe it's because he knew where the bodies were buried and they'd never find them. And ultimately... did he, though? Did he remember where the the, the bodies were? But ultimately... Because Brady and Hindley didn't. Well, yeah. But ultimately, he was never going to help the police anyway. So he knew that from the beginning. So he was just trying to get... No, no, I, I know that. But I mean, like, if you have such a blatant disregard for human life that you just, like, people are just objects to you, they're not even humans anymore, that you just murder them and just bury them willy-nilly out in the back of the beyond. If you care so little enough to treat a human being like that, you're not going to remember where you ditched their body, are you? You're just like, for, it's like throwing away a sweet wrapper or something. I can't remember which bin I put it in. Yeah, yeah. No, that that is that is very true. Very true. So I I wouldn't even even if he'd said yeah yeah I'll I'll uh, t- I'll take you to where all the bodies are. You don't remember? Shut the fuck up. No, get back to prison. Yeah, yeah. He was just stringing it out. Uh, mm-hmm. But thankfully, he's dead. Uh, just not in the horrible way that we would have enjoyed. No, not at all. And unfortunately, as we say, Hendy's free. I was just about to say, if you're living in Montana. And there's an odd woman that lives down the road from you and she's got a big scar on her neck. The the shape of an ice pick, like, blade. Don't go asking for cake mix. Don't go asking for cake else. mix and stick a petrol bomb through a letterbox. Yeah. Or at the very least, if you're not as horrible as, you know, me, I guess, at least key a car. Yeah. I mean, in no way do we support violence against people, especially criminals who have been rehabilitated and released back into society. Kia car. Yeah. Just Kia. Yeah. And on that bombshell, (laughs) I don't think it's a better place to end. This has been (laughs) the MO Podcast with me, Conservation Sam. And me, Atreya. Thank you all so much for joining us, and we shall see you next time. Bye. Bye.